Hi guys, it's so Hi. nice to see you. <laughs> um, I'm sure this is a big draw. Everyone knows Benchmark. This firm has done a lot in its near 30 year, 30 year history. Um, and with a sort of famously very small team, it has invested in some of the world's leading uh, consumer brands and enterprise brands. Um, Uber, Airbnb, or I'm sorry, not Airbnb, uh, Uber, <laughs> um, uh, Airtable, Hacker One, uh, et cetera, et cetera, eBay. Um, and again, what's sort of, in sort of interesting about Benchmark is that it has sort of, some would say stubbornly maintained its uh, sort of feel and size over the years, which is really incredible. And I wanted to start there. Um, Peter, if you don't mind answering the question, I did see over the last couple of years, there were sort of reports that Benchmark was getting, you know, certainly feeling frustrated somewhat that um, kind of bigger pocketed rivals were coming in and, and, and competing more aggressively with companies that maybe Benchmark would have liked to have funded. Um, I'm assuming that Benchmark could raise as much money as it wanted. It has consistently raised funds that are around $425 million, you know, fund after fund. Um, so I wanted to give you the chance to sort of address that. Yeah. Um I, I like that you mentioned Airbnb because that's one of those, <laughs> on our long list of deep regrets, um, the opportunity had presented itself to us and, and typically, you know, the industry when I joined was, well, a Series A investment, you buy 20 to 25 percent of a company for a number today that sounds like a seed um, for, you know, seven to ten million. And, you know, we missed the opportunity at Airbnb because we had a ownership threshold that it was impossible to achieve. And I think we've sort of relaxed that as a constraint because it's not, it's not a question of what can benchmark own. It's, of course, what's, what's the company's potential? What can it be worth? And I, our model at, at, at 500 million and not scaling it has come from the core belief we have of a small fund where a few, we make a few commitments a year to be very deep partners to entrepreneurs doesn't scale. And if, if the relationship depth is a function of a few very big relationships, then uh, by keeping the fund small, we kind of force that discipline mm -hmm. of really being selective, but also accepting the fact that the industry can be you know, giant below us and giant above us, and, and yet this basic contract we have of partnering with an entrepreneur for a decade is fully intact. And some people choose that. Some people choose not to have a, a relationship with a venture firm like ours. And, and we think that that's actually a very healthy thing. There's diversity. But, but the idea of building a bigger fund, I think, would undermine that. And uh, I joked with Victor, so one of the reasons of keeping it small is it forces us to earn our seat at the table versus buy our seat at the table. And that comes out of references and the quality of work that we do with an entrepreneur as opposed to writing a bigger check. Sure. And I'm sure also it makes it easier to uh, get returns, see returns. I mean, a lot of the funds that raised uh, big funds in recent years are now sort of you know, struggling to either subsequently raise bigger funds or yeah. even uh, the same size funds. Um, I also just wanted to ask, it's hard enough to see all of you in Silicon Valley and four of your six general partners are here. That's a big showing. Um, I'm just wondering if you want to talk a little bit about why that is. Victor? I think there's something really special about Finland. And so I come from a gaming background. So mm -hmm. I, I built a company over 13 years in the mobile gaming space. And, and Finland is the capital of uh, mobile gaming, right? And I think what, what's interesting is why, why a country like relatively small is able to produce things that are much, much bigger than they should. And I think, I think the thing that I think is interesting about Benchmark is this intense curiosity to understand what's going on in different parts of the world. Mm. So if I had to explain like why are four, part, four benchmark partners here, the best way I can explain that is slush is, is so interesting. It's like in the middle of the winter in Finland, but it's so special. There's so many amazing things here. And I think it's not, there's no like business reason for us to be here. It's much more like, wow, like this is, this is exceptional. And like we wanna, we wanna understand everything that is exceptional that is happening in the world. Great. Well, there's obviously a, a, a huge audience of founders who wants to understand what specifically uh, Benchmark is looking to back right now. So, Miles, going in order here, uh, maybe you can tell me a little bit about what makes a, what makes a Benchmark deal in uh, 2023. Yeah. Um, 
as, as Victor was saying, obviously, uh, the epicenter of mobile gaming was actually having a coffee yesterday with Ilka, uh, you know, the founder of Supercell. And, and Victor and I were chatting with him about what makes a great leader for one of his studios. And, and curiosity and love of the game, like love playing the games that you create, were, were the top two things that he mentioned. And it's funny because it resonates a lot with, I think, what we look for when we spend time with founders. Um, curiosity, really a, a strong learning mindset. Um, you know, we, we often talk about it as learn-it-alls, not know-it-alls. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then passion, authenticity, right, is, is the other version of the love of the game. It really is, um, it will be the founders, um, sort of the pinnacle of their potential life's work and, and, and a really motivated mission. <clears throat> and that will drive so much that, that flows from that, um, uh, uh, a lot of the learning too. Um, and so I think those are some of the character traits um, we really look for. And outside of that, um, you know, we don't have, there's no rule, rule book. Um, if you listened into our conversations when we're, when we're dreaming internally, you know, after a, we've had the fortune of sitting with a, with a founder, um, the conversation is as much as anything, how do we navigate that dream with them? Um, how do we look into that future? What can go right? Um, not, what are any, not what are any issues. And to, to the thing that doesn't scale, uh, it doesn't scale because we think about joining the team. Um, and, and, and that manifests as a board role in, in, in all cases. Um, but it's really about joining that team um, and, and imagining recruiting tens, hundreds of people directly over the course of a journey for that. Um, and so when we sit down with someone and can peek into the future with them, that's what's get us excited. But there's no, no, no rule book, no, no, no set criteria. Um, but that's sort of the emotional feeling that, that comes and, and animates. That's great. If I could add, sure. like, I think, you know, so, so, so often when you ask that question to a VC, you get some flavor of a similar answer. If I were to think about, like, what might be a little different in the way that we approach that answering that question, there's this idea that oftentimes you see like an ambitious founder and they direct their gaze at this big market. And you know, they'll say something like, if we just get 1% of this market, we'll build a billion dollar business. And we're really looking for the founders that have that ambition, but they direct it more like a laser beam to an opportunity that they can really excel at. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, and nail that value proposition from there with that customer expand from there into mm -hmm. the bigger market, but it's usually one where there's a lot of dynamic change happening. And that's, that's more often than not the recipe that we're, we're, we're focused on. And, and just in terms of a recipe, I mean, you all have many years of experience um, either you know, running companies or, or investing in them. Are there any patterns that you've um, established in terms of like whether or not you feel comfortable investing in a, you know, a, a two-person two team um, and or red flags that you uh, are sort of wary of? Miles? Constantly looking for the exception. You know, any, any attempt at a rule um, always finds a way to be broken, so. <laughs> and, and I'll add, you know, I think we were looking recently at the, uh, the investments that we've made so far this mm. year and you would know the stat better than I do, some, some large percentage of those investments were actually at incorporation of the yeah. company. And so more often than not, it is actually two people who see an opportunity and, and we're, we're getting there before they've even left their last job mm -hmm. to start that company. And, and so we're, you know, we really focus on being Ideally, that first board member, the first partner to a founder when they are embarking on this, on this journey. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a large, large percentage of the time where that's first money, two people, and an idea. That's great. Well, you know, I wanted to ask about that, actually. It's very interesting to me that lately in um, you know, the Bay Area, there's been a lot of talk about board seats and whether they matter and how effective investors can really be if they're sitting on the board. Uh, Vinod Kosla famous investor who's been saying lately, it's not a good idea uh, to be on the board. I talked to Dick Castolo, the former CEO of Twitter recently. He said the same thing. He was like, oh, VCs are really not getting, you know, great information in the boardroom. I wonder what you make of that. Yeah, um, we feel 
I would say almost existentially committed to the role we play mm. um, is best manifest through serving on a board. And it's an interesting hack, the venture business, which is the, you know, we codify a relationship typically with money, mm. um, but then we join the board governance structure and the person that takes our money, we have power over. Like in theory and governance structures on boards, you can hire and fire the CEO. That's the biggest job of the, of, of the board. And you know, in my view, the really great businesses are built with boards that have a partnership with the CEO, that have a gaze to the horizon of what's possible that's bigger than any one person. And I think that the integrity of that structure has been tested throughout the entirety of our C-Corp business model. And we moved into crypto, we got rid of boards. And we said, well, who needs boards? Who needs company building and all that stuff? And you know, um, it created interesting token value, but I don't think it built equity value. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of a board is carrying the intentionality of the business to be serving a purpose greater than any one person, and the directors playing a role as a partner to the CEO whose entire existence is to make that CEO successful. At least like, that's the way we conceive of it until there, if there is a point in time where that's not possible. Either the CEO raises their hand or the board is faced with that really awful decision of mm -hmm. saying this is not working. But, but I think you know, we're gonna move, I, my sense is we're moving through a period of time where the idea of governance, we just went through it at OpenAI, it, it percolates up to the top of people's consciousness mm -hmm. and we can see what happens when the governance structures are misaligned. And, I have a personal view that my partnership with a great CEO uh, is deeply enhanced by knowing that I'm carrying the fiduciary responsibilities that, that they carry with them close to their heart. Mm -hmm. And that if I'm not serving on the board, I can be effective, but it's not the same. You know, we all learned from Bill Campbell, who was a great mentor to many of the startups Benchmark work with. Arguably, he was one of the you know, silent founders of Benchmark. And he got to the point where, and, and I think Dick has echoed this, it's, it wasn't effective for him to serve on the board because he was trying to be a coach mm -hmm. to the CEO. And he's like, as soon as I'm in the boardroom, I'm in the governance structure, um, it gets confused by that. But he was on the board at Apple. He was on the board of Intuit. He was on the, you know, he wasn't on the board of Google and he was super effective there. So I, I think you ultimately, as a CEO, look for a partner that can have deep context, that can be with you shoulder to shoulder through the decade long journey our board role codifies that. And I, I think CEOs that select that have built the biggest companies on earth. You know, you mentioned OpenAI. I think something else interesting happening there that um, also ties back to something that we've seen in recent years that sort of dispenses with traditional norms, and I wonder if it's the new new or it's something that's going to change back, uh, is founders and employees uh, cashing out somewhat early, selling their, their stakes to secondary buyers. So OpenAI, it's really interesting to me, we're talking about a lot of money. This company, is, its valuation has soared to the heights, I, I, you know, might be the fastest growing um, company in terms of valuation ever. And I think some of the employees are selling their shares, which is great for them, but of course I do wonder if it's early on. So I wonder, uh, including for the founders in the audience who are wondering, is this acceptable? Uh, and at, at what point, what are your thoughts as a firm on founders and employees cashing out relatively early in the process? So we asked, um, what does benchmark look in a company? And a lot of it comes down to the founder. And there's a specific type of founder that we like to, to work with. And it, there's no like criteria that we can describe. But if there was one, there's, there's one thing is like, OK, what's the purpose? What is, what is this person trying to optimize for? And the founders that we admire the most are founders that they see an important industry that could be better, and they want to make that industry better, right? And if you're working with founders like that, typically, they're not, they're not there to sell a bunch of secondaries very early on. So on the specific question like, hey, are, is the firm pro selling secondary? Is the firm against selling secondary? Like, the firm doesn't have an opinion on that. But the firm does have an opinion on the types of founders that we want to partner with. And we want to partner with the founders that care first and foremost about building something that is amazing. Right? So throughout a journey, if the company is generating um, a lot of value, and, and at some point, it, it, it's a natural thing for the founder to have some liquidity. But always, 
the purpose of like transforming an industry has to come first. Mm -hmm. Um, I also wanted to ask about valuations really quickly. Victor, your company is very interesting. So you co-founded this company with your brother that's been very successful, Wild Wildlife uh, Studios. Um, so Benchmark had led a, a round in your company in 2019, $60 million at a $1.3 billion valuation. And the next year, Vulcan came in, Paul Allen's uh, management company, and led a $120 million investment at a $3 billion valuation. Um, I'm not questioning that valuation, but it was interesting because so many companies were seeing these huge valuation leaps. Um, yeah. And I'm, again, wondering as a firm, how you think about that, how you counsel your startups. Obviously, it's good as an early stage investor if somebody's marking up your deals, but it does, in some cases, cut off options for founders uh, in terms of their exits and what's going to happen in subsequent rounds. So, Yeah, I think that... You know, 2021 and like beginning of 2022, we saw, we definitely saw dislocation in the market. Mm -hmm. And so, so when, when I partnered with Benchmark and, and Peter joined my board, there was just a, this intense desire of working together. And I really wanted to work with Peter because I felt that he was someone that could transform, like help me transform the company. And, and I was lucky enough that he wanted to, to work with me, right? And then just being transparent, uh, we were in a, in a period where there's a lot of uh, capital chasing deals. And then there's this effect that like, after Benchmark invests in the company, like, everyone wants to invest in the company. Right? Sure. So like, the second round that we raised, we, we really had made like, no progress. But just so many people were interested. And I think we're, we're, we were a company from Brazil, and like, we're trying to move to Silicon Valley. And we were always like, very low profile. But like, all of a sudden, like, oh, like, Benchmark invested. And, and there's all these people coming in. And then I made the decision of, okay, there's, there's these funds that, that want to invest at, a, at a twice the valuation when like, really like not that much progress was, was made. And, and I made the decision of, okay, like, with more money, perhaps we can do more. But in retrospect, I think that like, myself and a lot of the founders in this period, like 2021, 2022, made the mistake of like, raising too much capital. And the problem with that, I don't think that the problem is when you raise too much capital at a, at a high valuation, like exit paths are, are close to you. I don't think that's the problem. I think the problem is you start going in unnatural directions. You start deploying more capital than what is natural to that business, right? And then like you grow your team and, and bigger teams, lots of times like they don't produce more. Like in fact, they produce less. And when, once you do that, you have to go through the painful process of um, like reducing the team. So, so what I think is, the best founders, they're not like, trying to maximize for like, um, like unnatural valuations and trying to raise too much money, because th that does distract from, from the core pu purpose of like, building the company. Mm -hmm. I think I the, the general advice we give at the moment is really to manage by like, performance and progress, not manage by valuation. Mm -hmm. right? And so um, the, n not, not, not make that some goal that has to be achieved you know, in some sense, kudos to, to CEOs who managed to raise low dilution capital um, in, in many ways. Um, but if you, get, if you get addicted to that drug and navigate based on that versus navigate based on customer need um, and, uh, and, and, and product journeys and, and, and the core of the business, um, your, your gaze has veered in the wrong direction. Right. Um, Victor, I just wanted to uh, thank you for being candid about not having done that much in the year um, in between, because I think six most months. Or six months. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to put you on the spot. I just thought it was interesting, and I know the company was older, um, so it wasn't like it was a, an overnight success, so to speak. But um, I, I think a lot of founders are trained to say, no, it's <laughs> yeah. we did, a, you know, we, we deserve that evaluation. Um, you know, I wanted to ask too. We are in the middle of this great reset. Uh, I saw a really interesting Peter Wagner quote where he said something like, "We've never been in the middle of a boom." and a downtime at the same time, the boom being related to, to AI. Um, but, but of course, things are very different than they were uh, back in 2020 when you raised that second round. So I'm wondering right now for the founders again in the audience, what does it take to get to a Series A especially? I keep hearing about the hurdle having risen. Um, I'm seeing a lot of seed stage companies getting funded again. So maybe Sarah, if you could talk a little bit about what you think it means right now to, to the land of Series A. You know, a lot of people talk about the bar being higher now. I think when you look at like a regression over historical norms, we went through a period when, you know, 
when there was just a lot of exuberance in the market, 2020, 2021, kind of some tale of 2022, where there was a feeling that gravity didn't exist, that the same fundamentals of business building weren't there. You had companies that would raise, you know, around three months later, and you know, three x the price. Three months later, two x the price. Like it was this time where there was this, you know, incredible orientation towards scaling a company as opposed to, as Miles was saying, the orientation towards the customer. Mm -hmm. And now that, you know, we are back into a place where we all realize that actually the work of building a company is is really hard, you know, and you have to have an incredible orientation towards the customer. You have to have an incredible orientation towards the fundamentals of the business that you're building. It's not just about the kind of the vanity metrics that I think a lot of people got lost in, which was growing these top line numbers, but it's ultimately, you know, are you doing it in a way where you're also building economic value for the, the company that you're building? You know, ultimately, the kind of old fashioned look of like, you know, these businesses ultimately the the ones that are in the kind of greatest expression of their financial success are ones that generate profit and, ca and cash flow. And so sure. you kind of pull that forward. You know, you pull the future, that future, that kind of in, in the the quest for building enduring value into that present. And it's a founder who is focused on the product that they're building for a customer that has the need and is willing to, you know, more often than not in the, in the business uh, use case, give you money for that. And, and so that has, that has actually always been what this, you know, what that quest of a founder is about, which is that fulfilling that need. And, and so I don't think the bar has actually changed at, for, from our perspective. And it is still what we've always looked for, that, that founder that we've all spoken to that is on a mission, that sees the future that other people don't see and is, you know, assembling the team to make it happen. Well, I want to add one thing, which is that, you know, we talk about the bar of the industry and you can aggregate and say collectively, has that bar gone up or down? Mm -hmm. But I think broadly the industry, uh, I've been in it for 25 years, has the feeling, the excitement, the um, anticipation that there'll be a company founded in the next 12 months, and I, and I really have deep convictions about this, that will transcend the market value of an Amazon or a Facebook mm -hmm. meta. Meaning the disruption of AI is the precondition from which a probably 20 year old founder or in their 20s founder will create a company that we're gonna recognize it when we see it. And, and so it's, it's the asymmetry of you can only lose a dollar on a bad investment and you can get near infinite on a good investment that the industry is excited about. And you know, I think that that, the sense of where is that relative to the historical trends, it, it feels like the beginning of the internet relative to the possibilities. And I'm excited for the industry to wreck a lot of capital trying to find that because we will find it. And that's exciting. It's an interesting <laughs> phrasing, wrecking a lot of capital, because I talked to you, Miles, back in June, and I thought it was really interesting. Obviously, the hottest companies right now, the most valuable um, and seemingly the most promising are these large language model companies like OpenAI, Anthropic. Uh, and you'd sort of suggested that Benchmark doesn't see it that way, that you think that value is actually going to go in the opposite direction while the applications on top of these large language models are really the, the place that you want to be. Yeah, I, I would say from a, a, a company formation perspective, it is an unbelievably exciting time, like more, more exciting than many of the last few years. Um, in that you have, you know, Victor and I were chatting, and like, you, you, you can talk to your computer now in a way. Like, you could say that and you don't sound silly. <laughs> um, I think if we look back at ourselves in a, in a few years, maybe even a year, we'll, we'll feel like we were primates kind of mashing rocks together to make fire with the way we like use software. You know, imagine in two years what you'll say of using Salesforce. It'll be weird probably that you had to click all these buttons and navigate around and it didn't do more for you. And so user expectations of what's possible, I think, are, are, are ratcheting up and you've got tectonic forces at play for um, uh, imaginative, um, creative founders to take advantage of. Um, I think the, the question becomes sort of the startup opportunity versus an incumbent opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think 
um, you know, counsel one has given to founders, you can never say where you should go, really. Like, that's, that's not what we do. We don't say where you should go. That, that's someone's dream. But I think the, the places to maybe avoid the traps, I think one of them is, is don't be Microsoft. You know, don't be the co-pilot game. Um, that, that's what they're doing. It serves their business model. It serves their product environment very well. Be, be, be more creative and ambitious than just a co-pilot. And the other thing I think is um, don't learn the lessons of crypto. Right? Crypto was a lesson of build it and they will come. Mm -hmm. um, and, and was a lesson of um, uh, 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 just sort of if you have this infrastructure, like it'll just do that. And I think there's an opportunity here for end user experiences, um, connectivity to, to, to needs, um, and imagining that possibility of really lived experiences in the hands of, of users or businesses is a really special and powerful thing on this new computing But platform. I'll come out because he's not saying it. We didn't invest in any large language models. And I think that, and, and maybe this is unique to Benchmark, but our view is that capital intensive, mm -hmm. we've been in some. <laughs> in Uber, we all took Ubers here today. Right. Capital intensive businesses and venture back companies have historically not been great mm -hmm. um, uh, partners. and. I think our faith is that open source will end up having a profound effect on the ecosystem. And we are, you know, all in a way, you know, soldiers in the army of tear down anything that's getting capital intensive and overbuilt and, and, and propagate a developer driven world. And these experiences in AI are going to be built by developers who are imagining stuff that no one can fathom at a large language model because they're so serving a different kind of platform horizontal need. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we haven't. We hope they do well. Yeah. We love the innovation, but we, I am particularly drawn to the idea that there's an open source founder probably in the audience that's going to surpass almost everything that you can do with capital. Guys, I have about a thousand more questions, and I see we're getting booted off the stage here. But thank you so much for taking the time, and thank you everybody for thank joining you. us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Slush. Thank you.